As I've mentioned before, I grew up in New York City, specifically in Harlem. And I recall a time when a decent number of my parents' friends moved out of our building. There was a movement to restore some of our neighborhood's local brownstones, and many of them were interested in becoming homeowners. The city even offered a brownstone lottery to offload about a dozen abandoned homes for cheap. I'm talking thousands of dollars. These were homes often over 100 years old with so much character and history. However, many were also in various states of disrepair. Boarded up windows and doors, graffiti on the walls, ivy growing up the sides, and empty. Many of those brownstones were restored to their former glory, and some folks who got in then now have homes worth millions of dollars. And I can't tell you what Harlem residents would give today for the opportunity to get a brownstone for an affordable price. But they can't, because today so many of the buildings in Harlem worth fixing are being bought by non-Harlemites and developers, then sold for millions of dollars, pricing out some of the locals. This is your classic example of gentrification. Gentrification isn't unique to Harlem. It's happened in other parts of New York City and around the country. In Baltimore, Washington, D.C., San Diego, the list goes on. It's nice to see rundown neighborhoods get spruced up, but should this be at the expense of affordability and long-standing community bonds? I'm Madhu Bakanola. This is TED Business. Our speaker today is Bree Jones, the founder of Parity, an equitable development company working to turn vacant buildings into opportunities for affordable home ownership. In this talk, Bree explains how she found a way to revitalize neighborhoods experiencing hyper vacancy without gentrifying them, actively supporting home buyers and transforming communities along the way. Then, after the talk, I'll share what some other organizations have done to tackle this issue of community revitalization. But first, a quick break. Picture this. You have the opportunity to own a beautiful home in a historic neighborhood with deep cultural roots designed by some of the best urban planners in the world, all in a charming waterfront city. You'd want to live here, right? But what if I told you that this home was in an area of Baltimore called the Black Butterfly, where block after block of these beautiful historic row homes sit vacant and are negatively valued, meaning that the cost to repair each home is actually more than what the market says it's worth? Somehow the market must be broken, right? What's going on here? I've been studying the way housing markets work or don't work for the last decade. I started my career in investment finance on Wall Street, but when my hometown on the outskirts of New York City began to be gentrified, it pushed me into becoming a housing advocate. I learned more about the racist policies mandated um, by federal and local governments, like redlining and urban renewal, that gutted once thriving black communities across the country and prevented black citizens from building wealth through home ownership. These communities typically face two trajectories. The first is a downward spiral where political and financial disinvestment causes hypervacancy and decay that pushes people out of a neighborhood. Big banks see this exodus as confirmation that these neighborhoods are risky, defeated, unredeemable. And so without investment, the cycle of distress continues. The second trajectory is gentrification, where developers are able to capitalize off of this distress by buying undervalued properties, pumping money into them without considering the needs or wants of legacy residents, and then renting or reselling them at much, much higher costs, causing displacement. So my question became, can we do development without displacement? Is there another way? I quit my job on Wall Street and moved to Baltimore, 
the city that birthed redlining with a single suitcase to find out. My first inclination was to meet with investors and you know to raise funds for my idea, and I was literally laughed out of the room. They said that my idea was impossible, and that we would build homes that would sit empty for lack of demand. But I knew in my heart of hearts that that wasn't true. Unexpectedly, in that moment, being rejected by investors was the most important moment in my journey, because I realized that we didn't need big institutions to affirm the value of our communities. We'd affirm our own value through social capital. And so I started my nonprofit Parity, which creates upfront demand for homeownership opportunities in neighborhoods experiencing hyper vacancy simply by tapping into existing social networks. What started as an idea from just one has grown into a collective movement of eight, then 19, and now 44 future homeowners, all through word of mouth. And we have a wait list of over. Thank you. Thank you. And we now have a wait list of over 100 people wanting to join our intentional community, like Yolanda. Who's ready to buy a home to leave a legacy for her daughters? Or Janae, a fourth-generation Baltimorean whose father vividly remembers the demolition of black homes to make way for a highway to nowhere. Iko, whose family left West Baltimore when he was just a baby, but now is coming back home to his origins to be part of the revitalization. And Medina, who, like me, came to Baltimore from New York. To settle down and build a future. There are three key reasons why our work is transformational. The first is that we are leading the purchase and renovation of dozens of decades-long abandoned buildings, and we're selling them at deeply affordable price points. The second is that we not only Support our home buyers to become credit qualified and mortgage approved, but we're creating the opportunity for folks to build deep social bonds and friendships with their future neighbors. And three, we're preventing the displacement of legacy residents by ensuring that they have the resources that they need to stay in their homes and transfer their wealth to the next generation. We're we're healing the social fabric of the neighborhood. As we're rebuilding the built environment, contrary to the dominant narrative, there absolutely is demand for housing in historically black neighborhoods devastated by racist policy. We've tapped into a hunger and appetite hiding in the blind spots of the traditional capital markets. Remember those folks that laughed me out of the room? Well, we have. More within just two years' time, we now have more demand for our homes than we have homes. We're sold out. And so, can we do development without displacement? We absolutely can. Thank you. I agree with Bree. The work she's doing is truly transformational. Both literally and figuratively. Thankfully, she's not alone. There are other great organizations doing work aligned with Bree's company. So here's a bit more on a few of them. For example, Genesis Housing Development Corporation offers affordable housing in New York State for individuals, families, and other groups like the developmentally disabled or people with physical impairments. Genesis works with local communities to identify and meet affordable housing needs by rehabilitating existing structures or creating newly built structures. There's also Abyssinian Development Corporation, which has been providing residents in Harlem with housing counseling through its Harlem Economic Literacy Program since 2000. They offer pre- and post-purchase education and individual counseling for those who need financial advice and support. They have helped nearly 350 people to purchase homes, with their mission being to uplift the Harlem community and rebuild Harlem brick by brick, 
block by block. Even financial services companies like Goldman Sachs have gotten involved in community development. They have a domestic investing and lending business called the Urban Investment Group, which is dedicated to community and economic development through real estate projects, social enterprises, and lending facilities for small businesses. Since 2009, they have participated in creating affordable housing in places like New York and Utah, and in 2014, they helped finance the redevelopment of Detroit's East Riverfront neighborhood, which saw the transformation of underused city-owned land into mixed-income apartments and over 10,000 square feet of retail space. So what do we take away from this? Truly transforming neighborhoods takes innovation from people like Bree. It takes dedication from development corporations to educate and keep things affordable. And it takes interest from investors, local organizations, and even non-local ones to lend their dollars and energy so that long overdue change happens. That's it for today. This episode was produced by Kiara Powell and fact-checked by Julia Dickerson. Special thanks to Anna Phelan, Michelle Quint, Corey Hagem, and Colin Helms. I'm Madupa Akinola. Talk to you again next week.